All right, so today I want to show you how to make an azanthic looking ball python without using the traditional recessive azanthic gene. And essentially what azanthic does is it strips all the color from the ball python. So you pretty much end up with a black and white and silver snake. It's pretty awesome. And if you're actually working with the traditional lines of the recessive azanthic, keep in mind there's actually different lines that are not compatible. So for example, if you actually took a TSK azanthic and you bred it to a VPI azanthic, essentially what you get is you get all normal looking snakes that are double head for each line of azanthic and if you actually bring those together you get azanthic looking snakes then a lot of a lot of people actually say you probably shouldn't do that project because if you actually produce visuals from the hatchlings you don't know which line of azanthic you actually have and you don't know what that azanthic is compatible with so most people haven't seen anyone actually breed different lines of azanthics together it kind of muddies the water but there's actually different ways that you can produce azanthic looking snakes without using the traditional recessive azanthic. So today I want to jump over the internet and I want to show you some ways that you can make an azanthic without using the recessive azanthic gene. All right, so I'm going to jump over here on morphmarket.com and I want to start with just a normal ball python so we can see what effect two copies of the recessive azanthic has on the appearance of the normal. And this is, I'd say, kind of a normal looking normal. The normals can vary quite a bit, but I'd say in most cases it usually has kind of a gold color on the sides and almost like a chocolatey brown background. Some normals are a little bit more yellow and some can be really super dark. And here's what happens if you actually take two copies of a recessive azanthic and work it into a normal. Take a look at this. Quite a big difference between an azanthic and a normal. And you'll notice it really strips away all the colors and you're pretty much left with like a black and silver snake in a lot of cases. And the azanthics can kind of vary. Sometimes you'll get azanthics that have a little bit of color in them and some, sometimes you actually see some of them kind of browning out a little bit as they age and mature. And there's actually a couple genes that you could work in with azanthic to make some really stunning combinations and really clean it up and probably the two best genes are the fire and the pastel take a look at this thing i think i pulled one up here this thing is crazy <laughs> look at that that is like a black and white snake and that is kind of what the you know the potential of an azanthic when you're working other genes into the mix and if you actually take a look at the genes on this one so this is actually a firefly enchi sk azanthic so essentially you start with the azanthic this is actually the tsk line of azanthic so you definitely don't want to breathe this to the other lines there's the vpi line and uh there's there's a couple other lines of azanthic there's actually there's actually the red azanthic which is a co-dominant gene some people consider that to be the only co-dominant azanthic and you can always get some azanthic looking snakes but essentially what you do is you add pastel and fire and it really cleans up and brightens the background and then you add enchi and it really reduces the pattern a lot of times enchi will bring out a lot of orange in combinations but you actually you make, you were trying to work color into an azanthic and most of the times most of the color it gets lost in the black and white snake pretty amazing combination so here's another way to actually make a combination that looks really close to an azanthic. Sometimes you can get pretty close and sometimes it's, you know, like a close second without actually using the recessive azanthic. And one of the ways is to actually use a combination of lesser and spider, which is kind of an interesting combination. So this is what the lesser looks like. The lesser usually brightens a lot of combinations and really enhances the definition between you know, kind of the contrast of the snake. The lesser is also in the blue eyed leucistic complex. So if you breed it with another gene in the blue-eyed leucistic complex, you end up with an all-white snake with bright blue eyes, which is pretty awesome. And if you actually take a lesser and you breed it to a spider, this is what the spider looks like. And the spider is kind of interesting. It gets its name from the spider web pattern coming right down the top of the snake. And I think my favorite spiders, I have to admit, that a lot of the spiders have this white coming up the sides. I say this is probably a really high white spider with a, almost like, it's kind of like a pseudo cal calico coming up the side of the snake and it doesn't have any calico in it as a matter of fact if you actually add calico to a spider especially a high white spider it'll bring this color, this white color all the way up to the top and you get just a little bit of color right on the ridge which is kind of crazy so here's what happens if you take spider and work it in with lesser take a look at this this almost looks like an azanthic it's kind of an interesting combination and you can definitely see the influence of the spider web pattern coming right down from this 
spider and I, it's, it's kind of interesting I still can't wrap my head around why the lesser would interact with the spider to make these azanthic combinations it's kind of one of those what kind of one of those weird anomalies and sometimes you actually get these lesser bees which is the the, the lesser and the spider a lot of times it'll actually have quite a bit of color coming through sometimes it's a little bit reddish brown and sometimes you actually get these really bright azanthic looking snakes and you can also make this combination using the butter instead of the lesser a lot of people think the butter and the lesser are just two different lines of the same gene although I think there are differences between the lesser and the butter but you can get pretty much the same result with the butter so take a look at this. This is actually almost a recessive looking snake, just as a standalone gene. As a matter of fact, this is a this is a bamboo. This is Bobby, the snake that's around my neck at the beginning and end of every video. I actually bought him over here on Morph Market, and I'd say Bobby. A lot of times you can actually see a lot of bamboos that are more azanthic looking than Bobby. Bobby has quite a bit of color. You see kind of this gold color coming right down the top of a snake. If you actually look at him at the end of the video, you notice he has quite a bit of color. I actually pulled up another bamboo. Bamboos can be really variable from one to the other and I pulled up another one. Take a look at this. This is a really azanthic looking bamboo. Kind of crazy. Almost completely black and white and it'd be kind of interesting. I actually haven't searched over here to actually see an azanthic bamboo and compared to this but I'd say it's probably pretty close. I don't know if you can get more black and white than this version of the bamboo. So here's another way you can make an azanthic snake. You can actually start with a pied. A pied is a recessive mutation. You need two copies of the pied for visual. And essentially what the pied does is it brings in these big patches of white in the snake. And sometimes you'll get a high white pied and sometimes you'll get a low white pied with just a little bit of white. I've actually seen some pies with almost no white. And, then, and with a low white pied, it really scrambles up the pattern, which is kind of an interesting anomaly. And you can actually take the pied and you can breed it with a super black pastel which is in a lot of cases these super black pastels are almost jet black it's pretty amazing and you can actually get super black pastels that are a little bit it's like a cinnamon color kind of a, like a reddish brown it really depends on the version of the super black pastel so if you take the super black pastel and you work it into the pied which is a little bit difficult because you need two copies of each gene this is what you get take a look at this you get the panda pied and it doesn't really look like an azanthic but it's pretty much you know according to the definition of azanthic it pretty much is stripped all the color and you end up with a black and white snake pretty amazing and these panda pies are super expensive actually take a look at this one this one actually sold for ten thousand dollars that is crazy of course that was back in 2016 i think even uh, it's been what four years since this one sold and there's still like thousands and thousands of dollars for these panda pies there's not a whole lot of people producing them and they sell really good kind of crazy on the prices so here's another way you can make an azanthic snake. You can actually take the Mojave. The Mojave is in the blue-eyed leucista complex, and you can actually breed it with the lesser, which is also in the blue-eyed leucista complex. And this is what you get. You end up with an all-white snake. And I guess technically you could define an all-white snake as a pseudo-azanthic because it doesn't have any color. It's I guess it's kind of cheating on this one because you know it's, it's kind of you know per the definition of azanthic, you stripped away all the color, but it doesn't really look like an azanthic. Like that's just not that's just kind of one version of the blue-eyed leucistic. As a matter of fact, I actually did a video on how many ways that you can make an all-white snake, and there was like I think we came up with like 42 different ways to make an all-white ball python. Kind of crazy. So here's another way you can actually make a real good looking azanthic looking snake. You can actually start with the pastel, which is kind of interesting that you can make an azanthic starting with such a bright gene. The pastel is usually really bright yellow. And a lot of times the pastels will really reduce the pattern on the snake. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen some Enchi pastels that look <laughs> kind of reduced. Usually Enchi will reduce the stripes down this, and sometimes they can kind of trick you thinking you have Enchi in the mix and it can just can be a really reduced version of pastel. 
And the pastels can really vary a lot of times. Sometimes they can be really bright and sometimes they can be a little bit browned out. And you can actually take the pastel and you can breed it with a cinnamon, which is an interesting combination. And the, the, the final result as far as what you get with breeding the pastel of the cinnamon really depends, I think, mainly on which version of cinnamon that you're actually using. Some of the cinnamons are really dark, like a dark normal, and some of them are like a really reddish brown, almost a coppery brown color. Quite a few versions of cinnamon. But if you use, I'd say if you use the one, the, the version of cinnamon that looks like a really dark normal without the reddish brown, this is what you get when you breathe the cinnamon to the pastel. You get the pewter. Take a look at this. This looks really close to an azanthic, kind of a, a completely black and white snake. And you can tell this one has just maybe a little bit of reddish color coming right there. I've actually seen some without any red at all. This is pretty close to a regular azanthic with just the black and white. And sometimes you can get these pewters that have quite a bit of red in the mix. I'd say probably maybe, you know, I'd say maybe 25% of the time you'll actually get a pewter that looks really awesome like this, that looks like a true azanthic. As a matter of fact, you can actually, if you look at the genes on this one, this one has the cinnamon and the pastel in the mix, and you can actually add more copies of the cinnamon or the pastel to get some more azanthic looking snakes. So take a look at this one. This is actually the silver streak, which has two copies of the pastel and the cinnamon. So this is a cinnamon super pastel. So if you have one or more copies of either gene, you can make some really a kind of crazy looking azanthic snakes. And take a look at this one. I have another one. This is actually the silver bullet, which is looks pretty azanthic. As a matter of fact, these are getting like more and more silver instead of more azanthic. So sometimes the azanthic can look pretty silver. And the silver bullet actually consists of the super cinnamon plus the pastel. So it's, it's either one copy or two copies of either gene. As a matter of fact, you can have two copies of each gene, and you got, this is what you actually get. You get the super pewter, which is another kind of azanthic looking snake. And essentially what happens is, in the super pewter, you're actually using the super cinnamon, which is the all black snake with no pattern at all. And then essentially you're adding in the, the two copies of the pastel to really change the color to almost like a silvery, kind of a silvery gray kind of an azanthic looking snake pretty awesome so here's another way you can make an azanthic looking snake. You can actually use the champagne. And the champagne, I'd say, is a little bit tricky to work with because when you mix other genes in with champagne, a lot of times the champagne can be so visually dominant, a lot of times you end up with a patternless snake or a snake with just a little bit of pattern that is a slightly different color than what you started with. Sometimes if you mix multiple genes into a champagne, it's really difficult to actually pick out which genes are in the champagne. If you actually take the champagne and you breed it to a super simple Cinnamon, you get an interesting result and this is a kind of a reddish brown version of the super cinnamon sometimes they're like almost jet black and sometimes they're quite a bit lighter than this almost like a like a light brown it's, it's kind of interesting how the super cinnamons change and here's what happens if you take the super cinnamon and you breed it to the champagne this is what you get you get a gray matter which is pretty awesome essentially what it looks like it looks like a pied with these big splotches of white although there's no pied genes in the combination which is kind of interesting and then all the color on the snake is kind of like washed out into this almost like a silvery gray kind of azanthic it almost looks like an azanthic pied as a matter of fact i should have pulled up an azanthic pied because it looks really similar to this working the true azanthic into a pied so here's the last one I wanted to show you. This is another way, kind of a newer way you can make an azanthic looking snake, and that is using the scaleless head. And the scaleless head, I'd say, is fairly new on the ball python scene. It's probably one of the newest genes that have been around and kind of proved out, and people just went crazy over it. As a matter of fact, when I started in ball pythons like five years ago, these were selling for $45,000 for a scaleless head. It was crazy, and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I started out watching Morph Market, and these would post for like crazy money, and they'd sell within a week. It was amazing. And if you actually look at the price on the scaleless head now, this is going to blow you away. Take a look at this. This snake actually sold for $150. That is like the, the biggest price drop I've ever seen of any gene in all of ball pythons. Kind of crazy. And I jumped into the project and I have a whole bunch of scaleless head stuff. And I made a little money along the way. And so I definitely got my money back. But I just couldn't believe how fast the project dropped. It was pretty amazing. If you actually take two scaleless heads and you breed the 
scale his heads together. And essentially, this is what you get. This is a completely scaleless ball python. So it's a ball python completely stripped of all the scales, which is kind of interesting. And you end up in most cases with a, a, a kind of an azanthic looking snake that is just kind of black and white and gray, which is kind of an unusual effect. As a matter of fact, if you actually work a lot of genes into the completely scaleless ball pythons, a lot of times you'll still end up with kind of an azanthic looking snake. And it's almost like you have to relearn all your genes again, working on the completely scaleless because sometimes the visual appearance can really change. And kind of the other weird thing is I've actually heard some people that actually picked up and touched the scaleless and they said it doesn't even feel like a ball python. It has a completely different texture, which is a pretty interesting characteristic of the scaleless. All right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Brian Motes asks, when breeding ball pythons, how many times do you pair your males with your females? And that is a very good question. So essentially what I do is I start pairing up about mid-October and I continue cycling my males through my females for about five months. It's quite a long time until I stop cycling the males. And when I first started in ball pythons, I'd pretty much get my males in with the females every two weeks, maybe even a week and a half. I was, I was kind of really aggressive at the very beginning. And then pretty much later on, I found out that you really only need to pair up your males and females pretty much once a month through the breeding season so that would mean about five times during the season but what I found in the last couple years is that a lot of times if they don't breed the first time you pair them up or the second time you can have eggs that are kind of really late into the season so what I think I'm going to do this next year is I'm going to start pairing up maybe every two weeks at the beginning of the season maybe for the first few pairings and then kind of cut back to once a month towards the end of the season to kind of try to concentrate all the eggs into a shorter time frame so I don't have eggs that are really late in the season. And the problem is if you have eggs that are really late from some of your females, a lot of times you can't get those females back up to wait to go into the next breeding season. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.